dad is here now, chill out. Comfort. Comfort. The church at a time like this needs to take comfort in who God is. We need to take comfort in the stability of God's spirit, of his personality, of the power of his words, of his inability to lie to us. Take comfort that God is with us and that everything is going to be all right. Take comfort that God is saying, I got this. I got this. I've got this. I've got this. Comfort, 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 conviction. Whenever you go through a storm, there ought to be a conviction. You know what? Man, man, I shouldn't even come out here. Whatever you're doing wrong, the storm reminds you to get it right. Conviction is never about making you feel guilty over what has happened in your life. Conviction is a moving grace of the Holy Spirit for us to get right when we've been wrong. If you've been living a wrong life, a wrong lifestyle, wrong choices, wrong attitudes, whenever you get in a storm, that's the time to get it right, to come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, whatever is in me that needs to be fixed, fix it, Jesus. It is a time when you're in a storm, it's a time that you search and you get a conviction because conviction brings the knowledge, it brings the strength and the determination of will to get right with God. Truth brings the conviction necessary for change. And so that's why when you're in a storm, sometimes God will, he will confront you with truth because truth brings the conviction. When you're in a storm, you start wondering, oh God, did... Am I in this storm for anything that I did? So it is a time to say that whatever it is, whether you've done something, whether somebody in your house has done something, whether somebody in your community has done something, whether somebody in your world has done something, because our world is sick. The waters are are, are reeling. The the ice is melting in in the cold, in in the the extremities of, of the poles, the North Pole, the South Pole. Something is happening and we have to be the big people because The large church is not the church that has a lot of seats in it. The large church is the church that has concern for those outside of its own walls. It's the one that takes responsibility for the city. It's the one that will repent under the conviction and say, God, forgive us for living as though there is no God. Forgive us, O Lord Jesus, for thinking that we could do this without you. Because in a time like this, degrees from the highest schools of academia... And the greatest amounts of money does not insulate you. Because when pestilence come, it is not going to check your walls on the degree. And it's not going to check to see how your financial portfolio is doing. It will go to races without respect of race, gender, education, economic or social status. It's coming across. And it brings a conviction that God, I've got to do was right, but you take comfort in the fact, I'm with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Comfort, comfort, conviction, comfort, conviction, clarity. Because when you get in a storm, you become real clear of what matters and what does not. When you get in a storm, You're not trying to say, oh my God, let me get my Gucci bag and let me get my my designer shoes with my designer purse. That's not what you're thinking about. It's like, Lord, where are my children? Where's my spouse? I'm just trying to get, you're not trying to say, oh my God, let me see if my car is okay in the garage. No, no, no. When you're in a storm, you get clarity as to what matters. Your priorities come into view when you're in a storm. If you're about to die, when you're in that storm, the storm brings clarity, clarity, clarity. When that storm, I, I, just, I just heard these words floating up out of my spirit. Comfort, I'm with you. Chill out, relax, take courage. Conviction, what do you need to move to get right? Clarity, what really matters? What matters? And are my priorities in the right place? It's amazing when people get in a storm how selfish they become. Fights broke out over toilet paper and water. Fights trying to, because 
thinking that I'm going to be without. And it makes everybody selfish, only thinking about themselves. When you get in a storm, it's time to say the compassion of God. If you see somebody else who's in the storm and you've got shelter, it's like, come on in here, baby, out of the storm. Come on. I don't even have to know you, but my humanity says, come on. You've been laid off all week. Baby, I got something. I can help you. I, you come over here and get your meal. And when children, their schools are closed and then they're not able to, they were, they were eating the majority of their meals depending on the hot meal that they were getting from the school because they were not getting it in the home. And now what happens? And they're looking for, they're looking for answers. And it's the time for us as the church to be able to take comfort in Jesus. It's a responsibility for us as a church to have the conviction of the Holy Spirit to be the church, to be who God has called us to be and to repent of whenever we've been wrong. And it's to say, God, give me clarity. Show me what to do first. Help my priorities to get in line. Show me what matters. Jesus, help me to be compassionate. The lives of others. That's a compassion that flows out of our heart. And he wants us to be able to have this compassion that we share toward others. That's what being the church is really all about. He's called us to be the church. Not merely to go to church, but to, to be the church. Whether we are gathered or whether we are scattered, we're still the church. Even if you have family that lives in a different parts of the, of the city, or different parts of the state, different parts of the nation, or different parts of the world, it never stops you from being family. I've got a daughter and son-in-law in Germany. They're still our family. It never stops us from being family just because somebody lives in California and somebody lives in New York. You're still family. Distance doesn't stop you from being family. And I just want you to know that whenever you're going through something, just realize the Lord is bigger than the storm you're in. The Lord is bigger than the storm you're in. The Lord is bigger than the storm that you're in. It amazes me that the weatherman says that a storm is coming and everybody panics and then Christians say that Jesus is coming and nobody pays attention. And here, Peter and the disciples were in the worst storm of their life. Jesus was not in the boat, but he was walking to them on the water. So even sometime when you feel like he's not there, he's on his way. He's on his way. But I would encourage you to say this. Stop trying to get out of what God might have put you in. And learn to take courage in it. Jesus didn't wait until the storm stopped to tell them to take courage in the storm. After Moses died and new territory was to be taken and battles had to be fought, the Lord himself gave a charge to Moses' successor, Joshua. Here's what he said in Joshua chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the, of the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. And don't turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you might have good success wherever you go. And this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, so that you're careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have not I commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened, do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You face the storm and you'll find courage to stand through the storm. If you face the storm, you'll find courage to stand through the storm. And I want to admonish you today and say stop running from what is designed to produce strength because it's your obstacle course that is building navigational skills 
that you'll need in the future. And if you really want to survive your storm, let me give you a few keys. If you want to survive your storm, keep your mouth closed, but your heart open. Because when you hold your peace, you keep your peace. A ship does not sink because water is in the water. A ship sinks because water gets in the ship. As long as you keep your mouth closed, the water won't get in your ship and you'll be able to survive. Here's the second thing that I would tell you is to control what you can. Control what you can. If you can't control it, don't lose sleep over it. Control what you can. Control what you can. You can't control the economy. You can't control panic that's happening in the, in the minds and hearts of everybody else. You can't control somebody else's opinion. You can't control what people think about you and what they say about you. You can't con control what you can. Because the quality of your life is directly related to the quality of your attitude. It's directly related to the quality of your attitude. Because your attitude is framed by your thoughts. And that's why if a person's thoughts, their thinking is not right, if their attitude is not right, you can't give money to fix it because money won't fix a broken mindset. The quality of your life is depend dependent on your walk with God. You wonder how I and how well can my life be? It depends on your attitude. It depends on your walk with God. What is your walk with God like? Are you as close to Him as you need to be? Do you think about Him only when you get in an emergency? People who have a good close walk with God have a wonderful quality in their life. The quality of your life is directly related to your words. Be kind with your words. Be gracious with your word. Express thanks with your words. Be thankful. The quality of your life is related to the quality of your words. You find people with negative words, look at the quality of their life. Just check it out. The quality of your life is dependent on your food, the kind of food that you eat. Junk in, your system will back up on you. It's the quality of your food. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of your sleep. That's why the Bible says rest in the Lord. Your sleep, rest in the Lord, because if you don't get rest, you're no good to anybody. If you haven't had sufficient rest, it makes you irritable. The quality of your life depends on your sleep. The quality of your life depends on your fitness. You can be saved in your spirit, but if your body is in terrible condition, your, if your physical fitness is poor, the quality of your life is going to be impacted by that. The quality of your life is determined by your purpose. The purpose, the very thing, the focus that you have in your life. The quality of your life is determined by your environment. And so I would say to you, put things around you in your environment that remind you of where you're going. Not just pictures of the past. Put things in your environment that remind you of where you are going. If you're sick, get a picture of you when you were healthy because you're trying to move toward health. Put the picture of where you're going, put things in your environment that remind you of where you're going. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You need to surround yourself with people of where you're going. Don't just surround yourself with people that have your problem. Surround yourself with somebody that's got your answer. You need to put things in your environment that remind you of where you're going. Another thing that determines, perhaps the most significant, that determines the quality of your life are your relationships. The overall quality of your life is determined by the quality, the quality of the relationships that are in your life. People that have a bad life, they regret it, that they have met somebody and given access to a person who's brought misery into their world. It's not just keeping your mouth closed and your heart open beyond just controlling what you can. The third thing that I would say is to draw near to God. You draw near to God through your prayer. So pray. 
You draw near to God through praise. You draw near to God when you profess the promises of God. And you draw near to God when you practice reading and applying God's Word. Draw near to God. Pray, praise, profess the promises of God. Practice reading and applying God's Word. Don't just read the Bible. Apply it. It's not just getting the Word out. It's getting the Word in. It's getting it in so that you internalize it, that this thing becomes really who you are. And even when our world is in turmoil, just know God's with you. Jesus said, take comfort, be of good courage, because I'm here. He said, take comfort in my, in my presence. That's what he was reminding us here in Isaiah 43, that when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. And may I tell you one of the things that really blew the disciples' minds? It blew their minds when Jesus came to them on the water and said, It is I. Take courage. Don't be afraid. They heard his words. But they were not sure that Jesus loved them. That's why they said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Jesus, don't you care ab about us? We're about to die. Don't you even care about us? They weren't sure about his love for them. And they're not being sure about God's love for them created a bigger storm on the inside of them than the raging waters of the storm that was on the outside. If you're not assured of God's love for you, and it had nothing to do with Jesus not being able to articulate his love for them. He was expressing through his presence. But what confused them is that when Jesus came into their storm and his presence did not stop the immediate danger of the storm instantly because they made a wrong assumption that if Jesus is with you, no trouble will be around you. But Jesus will come even while the storm is raging, the wind is blowing vehemently, uh, the water is dashing and crashing as it crests even upon the sides of the ship. And they assume that if God is with you, you will have no storm. But Jesus was in the boat with his disciples and the storm raged on. And they were wondering, Lord, if you really loved us, why didn't you make the storm stop? Why is it that I'm having hell in my family if you love me? Why am I having financial trouble if you love me? Lord, if you are with me, why am I still sick in my body? And you got an internal storm that is worse than the storm that's on the outside. I'm just here to remind you today and assure you that the presence of the storm has nothing to do with whether God loves you or not. He loves you enough to be with you in your pain. He loves you enough to be with you in the confusion, to be with you in the discomfort, to be with you in the challenge, in the controversy, in the uncomfortable situation. He's with you. He's like a father in a gym trying to develop his son and the son is saying, Daddy, I'm hurting, I'm tired now. And the father is pushing them because he's more interested in your development than your comfort. And just because a storm is raising on, you know, Lord, why didn't you stop this? You could have stopped this. Why did you let my brother die? Why, God, did you let my mother die? Why, God, did you let my child die? Why? There's a storm that's raging on, but I'm just here to tell you that in the midst of it, he comes into the pain and he's right there with you, hurting with you. Sometimes the best therapy is not to try to give a person great advice. This is just come and sit with them while they hurt. Your presence speaks, and so does your absence. And I just want you to know that when there's a storm that's going on in your world, God is not just sitting high and looking low. He's on the water making his way to you. He's right in the boat with you, and he's saying to you, take courage. 
don't worry about what's going on on the outside I'm with you now look here he's saying refocus yourself get get a perspective don't look at what's going on in the world and what other folks are doing he says look up my faith looks up to you look toward heaven father my faith looks up to you my faith looks up to you at a time like this I don't know why this is happening I don't know what I've done to deserve this what I failed to do God but I'm hurting God when you get in those places of pain it's amazing how God can sustain you by his strength and by his grace I've watched so many people bury their loved ones and they they're like I don't even know how I made it through that it's because God was with you that he never leaves you and he never forsakes you and when you cannot feel the manifest presence of God you have to trust his omnipresence when you cannot feel the manifest presence of God trust his omnipresence because he said I'll never leave you I'll never forsake you I want to give you one final passage of Scripture that I believe that God spoke in my heart Psalm 46 it reminds us of this God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble therefore will not we will not fear though the earth gives way though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea though its waters roar and foam though the mountains tremble at its swelling Selah there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy habitation of the Most High God is in the midst of her she shall not be moved God will help her when morning dawns the nations rage the kingdoms totter he utters his voice the earth melts the Lord of hosts is with us the God of Jacob is our fortress Selah take a divine moment and meditate on what he's just said come behold the works of the Lord how he has brought desolations on the earth he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth he breaks the bow and shatters the spear he turns the chariots burns the chariots with fire be still and know that I am God I will be exalted among the nations I will be exalted in the earth the Lord of hosts is with us the God of Jacob is our fortress Selah right where you are one of the greatest storms in your life through the uncertainty the uncertainty of the severity the longevity of something it would be different if we knew that everything would be back to normal in eight hours 24 hours 48 72 but you don't know our comfort and consolation is not in what we know it's in who we know we know God and he tells us this is not even about you even having great confidence in my word this is about confidence in his presence God is our refuge and strength a very present help in the time of trouble nothing will ever change that whenever there is trouble there is God and whenever there is peace there is God that's why we don't just pray when we get in trouble but the Apostle Paul reminded the churches pray without ceasing pray in season and out of season it's always a time to pray don't wait until you get in trouble to pray but if you are in trouble my God there's no better time to pray and take refuge in the stability of the faithfulness of the character of who God is because if you will let your mind run back 
God has been with you through every storm that you have ever walked through, whether it has been death or sickness or depression. He has walked with you and been with you through every storm and he will not and does not stop now. I want to ask you, and right where you are, that you can know that God is your comfort. He comforts you in all of your ways. He loves you so much. And he said, I'm with you to give you my comfort. And I pray that you, through his word and just through his presence, will experience a conviction of God that moves you to do what you know to do is right. And I pray that God will bring such clarity to your mind so that you'll really know what matters. You'll know that it's not stuff, but it's about relationships. First and foremost, your relationship with God and then those whom God has entrusted into your stewardship. And then the compassion, which is your ministry. Jesus was moved with compassion and he healed them. Compassion is healing. It's not judging, it's healing. Somebody comes, they're bleeding, they're bruised, they're battered. That's not the time to give them the lecture. That's the time to give them compassion. And let God's love speak through the compassion. Compassion is just another word for the word mercy. And when you have mercy on others, God will have mercy on you. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. We pray that this message has encouraged, equipped, and empowered you to live a more victorious life. Join us next time for Power for Living with Dale C. Bronner, where revelation is power, power for living.